So we'll begin. Um, I am Tara, and I am passionate about how we talk about girls. I am one. And, um, and I currently lead a girls' school here in New York City called the Hewitt School. And we talk a lot about how we talk about girls. And so with that, you have their bios. I'm just going to um, thank Lisa Demore, author of Untangled, uh, Tanya Lee Stone, author of Girl Rising, and Nancy Jo Sales, the author of American Girls. And so with that, I always like to start with a why question. So why did you write your book? What drove you to write your books? What was your aim in writing them? Um, so my book is about adolescent development, and I'm articulating a developmental framework that applies to both boys and girls. Um, but my book focuses on the girl side of it. And one of my clinical colleagues, I'm a psychologist, um, has this great line, which is, everybody talks about adolescence, but nobody believes it. You know, and I think what she's talking about is that experience so often that parents have, where they hear about teenagers and they think, but my teenager won't do this to me. You know, mine will be the one who's awesome all the way through adolescence. And then, when teenagers start acting like teenagers, they think, oh, who messed this up? Right? Are you doing it wrong? Am I doing it wrong? And so what I wrote the book for was to say, look, adolescence unfolds in a predictable sequence. And any teacher can tell you this. right? There's the way the ninth graders act, and there's the way the 11th graders act. I mean, they change, and it's predictable. And when we know the sequence, and when we can appreciate that there are reasons that teenagers act the way they do, um, so, for instance, my favorite chapter in the book is chapter four, which is contending with adult authority, which is typically called adolescent rebellion, but I think it's really something much more fabulous than that. What I'm saying in that chapter is teenagers start to challenge adults because they realize how often we're making things up. And then they have to check on which of the things we're now saying are we making up and which are actually true. And this is an important developmental process. So my why is I wanted adults to understand the important features of normal development so that they could, I think, admire teenagers much more, um, appreciate them more, and be more helpful to teenagers. Well, um, I'd first like to say that your book is helping me a lot. Oh, I'm very glad. Old daughter. <laughs> so um, I went to see a film in 2013 called Girl Rising. And I went with um, a group of teenagers, two of my own and their friends. Um, and it's, if you haven't seen it, you should go see it. It's an incredibly powerful film that tells the stories of nine girls from nine different countries um, who have escaped a particular obstacle to education in their, each of their individual cases and are now being educated. So the film seeks to answer the question, why are there 62 million girls around the world who are not being educated? And what can we do about that? So I went with this group of teenagers and we had an incredible conversation that night about the emotional impact that they took away from the film. And then I revisited that conversation with them two weeks later. And I was um, somewhat surprised to find out that they couldn't speak to what any of the obstacles to education were. But they did retain this incredible, powerful emotional takeaway completely. They remembered the girls' names. Um, but they didn't really, they couldn't really explain, well, why aren't they in school and, and what's happening in those countries and, and what can we do about it? They couldn't speak to that. And I write books for teens, for kids and teens, and I write about little known stories and unknown stories, and I write about girls and women um, and, and stories that are missing from our histories. And I thought, I want to call this organization Girl Rising and find out if they would be interested in me writing a book that would expand the content more that teen readers and adults could hold in their hands and really, really think about and really kind of unpack what are these obstacles to education, how is it affecting girls, why is it girls and, and, and what th that we're focusing on, um, and tell a lot more stories. Because I, I had a hunch that in order to um, find the nine girls that they focused on in the film, they must have interviewed a lot more girls than that. Um, and I was thrilled, um, overjoyed, actually, to find a partner in crime in um, Casey Free Jennings over at Girl Rising who said, um, yes, let, let, let's have you do that. Let's do that. Um, and, and the whole process of it was kind of extraordinary because 
I then had to put myself in the shoes of all of these different cultures, different girls in different places, and everything that was being talked about in the previous panel about empathy, um, what, boy, you know, boy, did that push me to my discomfort level because, you know, I've basically written about American girls. You can't hear me. Put it higher. While she's doing that, I want to put a plug in for Girl Rising as a project. And CNN, on Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern, they're partnering with um, the First Lady. Um, there's actually updated figures. It's not 62 million girls. It's 130 million girls. Uh, UNESCO just came out with those figures, I think, over the last week, updating Michelle's 62 million. So it's just exciting to have Michelle Obama on uh, We Shall Rise or We Will Rise. We will rise. We will rise. That's right. And ac actually, the um, if you want to fix it. Um, so anyway, th the why for me was um, why don't we know about this more here? Um, why do we think about why don't we think about other people in other places? Uh, that these aren't other girls in other places. These, this is all connected to us. What's happening in these other countries, what's happening with girls all around the world, affects us directly. And, and how and why can we get to that point so that the conversation isn't so disjointed? And you know, we, I don't want to turn on the news and have people say, oh, I saw what was happening in Sierra Leone, I saw what was happening in Haiti, but that doesn't affect us. It does affect us. It affects us every day. It changes how the world functions, the fact that girls aren't being educated around the world. Um, well, I'm, am I on here? Can you hear me? I'm a reporter, I'm a journalist, and I, uh, I, my beat is teenagers. And, oops. Okay, sorry. Can you hear me now? No? Is that working? Okay, so um, so I've written about teenagers for about 20 something years. And it kind of happened by accident. I was working at New York Magazine in the 90s and there was a story that came up about teenagers in New York so they sent me and um, it kind of made a big splash, also kind of by accident. And so then every time this story came up about teenagers it was like, send her, she writes about teenagers. So okay. So this kind of happened, and I think if I was good at it, if I am, it's because I'm still very connected. This is something I haven't thought about until really recently, like since I've gotten older, but I'm, and when I was reporting this book, American Girls, I think I'm still very connected to those feelings of being a teenager, particularly around issues of gender. Because I, I really am very connected uh, to those feelings of like, wait a minute, that's not fair. Why is he being treated this way and I'm being treated that way? Uh, you know, sometimes it was, you know, serious things uh, even, like being catcalled for the first time. Or that's all sort of stuff that I'm, I'm connected to the outrage of that and sometimes puzzlement and amusement, like, oh really, you think I'm stupid? You know, so I, I, um, so I, I've been always been writing about girls and, and boys too a lot and talking to them and writing stories about them off and on and writing about other stuff too. So, in um, like 2012, oh and I have, I have a daughter who's 16, so Around 2012, 2000, 2013, early 2013, we started to see in the news a lot of stories involving girls in social media. And these stories were really dramatic and sometimes really horrific. There was Steubenville where there was a sexual, and, and often involving sex and sexuality and, and a kind of a publication of this, this, uh, these assaults. You know, there was Steubenville, videotape of a, of a girl being assaulted put online then she was you know slut shamed not only by her peers but by the wider community including adults um, there was Amanda Todd you know who I'm sure you know tragically killed herself uh, after having a 
naked picture of herself uh, shared non-consensually, of course, on the internet by an older man. So um, my boss, who's Graydon Carter at Vanity Fair, he uh, called me into his office and he said, and, and I was thinking about this stuff already, and so I'm the you know, one who writes about teenagers. So he said, uh, what's going on with girls? What's all this stuff about girls? You know, and, and it's hor these horrible things. So, um, uh, you know, I'm very lucky that I work at a place where there's like no agenda. Like you just, they just let me go out and like do my thing. So my thing was I wanted to find out, uh, is this something particular to girls, a particular time we live in, or you know, What's going on? So I went out to Los Angeles, and I went to a mall. I meet girls in all kinds of places, in all kinds of ways. But you know, malls are good because it's like, you know, if you're in the Sahara, you go to the watering hole. So I, I went to the mall, <laughs> the Grove in LA, and I saw these four girls coming out of the Cheesecake Factory. And they, they looked like we want girls to look at this age, which is about 16. Like they're happy, they're healthy, they're having a birthday party, they're carrying their leftovers. So I said, can I talk to you? Sure. So we sit down and I said, you know, I'm, I'm writing this story about you. I want to know what's going on with you. Tell me about you. That's all I said. And the first thing that one of them said to me, and this is 2013. Think about how fast things go in, in the world of technology and where we are now three years later. She said, social media is destroying our lives. And I said, why don't you just go off it? Which I would never say now, because I know that's impossible. But um, she, she, and then her friend said, because then we would have no life. And that kind of set up. That was like, you know, the wheel started turning. I said, whoa. And it really set up the next two and a half years for me as a, you know, a template for the sort of issues and conversations that we started to have, first for an article that I did for Vanity Fair, and then the book um, that came out in February. And um, it, it uh, was like this long, picaresque journey, <laughs> a lot of planes, trains, and automobiles, because like someone was saying before, and it's absolutely true, you have to go where they are. You know, uh, people do studies and research and, and you know it has its validity, and I and I and, and I totally understand where they you know do online surveys or they, they talk to people you know you know in, in more electronic means or whatever. I can't I can't get just as a reporter I, I, you know the karma made it all kind of hard on me because I can't get the same stuff and I can't understand it as deeply unless I go. So I went to you know uh, all kinds of places and talked to all kinds of girls, <coughs> over 200 of them. And uh, it was very heartbreaking and a, a lot, and uh, uh, very illuminating. Because uh, social media is, is like their life now. You know, I mean, well, as one girl described it to me, it's like a second world. It's like they live in two worlds now, of social media and the real world. And there's almost like a split, split screen, and they're kind of in, this, in both of them at the same time. And uh, it's creating all kinds of problems that I guess we'll get into. Speaking of split screens, I'm trying not to think about last night, which is impossible. Um, I'm going to make a shift here. Oh, we'll pin that thought just a second. Um, the inspiration of the title for this panel actually comes from the first line of Lisa Demore's book, and I'm going to read it to you. We need a new way to talk about teenage girls because the way people do it now isn't fair to girls or helpful to their parents. It's so true, isn't it? I would also add teachers too, right? Um, yet even as I say these words, talk about teenage girls, I'm highly aware as an English teacher of subject, we talk about verb, object, teenage girls, and the grammatical objectification, the systemic grammatical objectification of girls and of other people who are m marginalized. And um, we can't talk about teenage girls unless we also realize it's part of how we talk about women, regardless of one's politics. And we have a lot of work to do, obviously. So um, 
as we prepared for this conversation, and like the empathy panel, um, these fine authors have all read one another's books, and we've had a lovely conversation to prepare for today. As we prepared for today, these are very three very different books, but one point of common intersection that we found was just the ways in which all three of these books wrestle with the narrow way in which society today talks about girls and women, and how, of course, society today thinks about girls and women. And so I was wondering if you could please reflect a little bit with how your work wrestles with these, the problem of language, of course, but of also the problem of thought that is behind the problem of language. Um, I, was, I was thinking about that when we were talking because our topics are so very different. Can you, can you hear me okay now? Um, and especially because your two books deal with American girls mostly, and my book deals with not, not, not with American girls at all. Um, in that language, and what kind of um, change I underwent in myself as a journalist and as a writer as I learned more about the girls I was writing about. And I changed how I wrote about them as I wrote. So my, my final manuscript was much different in tone than my first draft. Um, as I really um, tried to put myself into the shoes of someone else and realized that we have a lot of cultural judgments that we make um, in our own country and then elevate that so much more when we go outside of the country and we're trying to think about things. So one thing that I was very careful not to do was to, um, of course, I am a white Western woman, so that's who I am. But I was very consciously trying to um, separate myself a little bit from that role and not assume that I knew or understood why a woman in Ethiopia would think that marrying off her daughter was the best choice. So Tanya, if I could just interrupt you. So there's a lot of chiming here, obviously, with the empathy panel, this kind of, this conscious process of not knowing, yes. not assuming to know Absolutely. one. Absolutely, I was nodding my head the whole time you guys were talking. Because, you know, our, our Western um, response to a woman selling her child or marrying her child to, to put her in a better place is thinking that we know better than she does. You know, I couldn't come from that point of view. And that was uh, a very conscious shift for me to say, no, you do not know what that girl's mother reality is, and you do not know what's best for her child. And there is a process of that mother also learning that there are alternatives for her that she is then coming to understand but to not be writing about it in a place of judgment. It was, it was, it was a fascinating experience, and, and one, like Adam said, put me in a discomfort zone a lot of the time and was the healthiest thing I've ever experienced. And I mean, just before we move off of Tanya Lee's book, you know, a lot of chiming, too, with the, the hero syndrome, right, that we were just talking about. Research shows that we Absolutely. rush in and we save our girls way faster than we do our boys. And the danger of objectifying the very thing you're trying to save is a great danger. Yeah. A grammatical danger, but it's also a, a, a danger of thought, right? To assume that you need to rush in and save. And to assume that you know what the solution <laughs> is. Well, let me start there. <laughs> because this is an interesting thing about being a psychologist, right? Is that we have these fantasies that we understand human beings. And and I wear a lot of different hats. No, I really mean that. I wear a lot of different hats. So I'm going to start from the psychology angle and bring it around to the teacher and the book angle. So one of the hats I wear is I train graduate students to be psychologists. So I get these you know, third and fourth year doctoral students who we have filled up with theory and we've emboldened with the idea that they understand human beings. And then they come to my office with um, transcripts from their psychotherapy sessions. And I go through them with them. And I, I try to do it as if I haven't done it every year for the last 15 years now. I try to do it fresh. Basically, I have to convince them, you know nothing. You know nothing about what's going on with this person. You know nothing about what's inside of them. 
And I have this spiel, and I say basically, think of every person as the greatest novel ever written, and you're helping them try to understand their story. You don't know their story, and our job as psychologists is to figure out what happened in chapter one and how that connects to chapter seven, but you know nothing. You know, and I, I've sometimes made them cry, which I, I think is okay. <laughs> so, so here's, Here's where it then shows up in my book, right? So I have the extraordinary honor of being a psychologist. And I will tell you, the longer I practice, the more humble I become in the face of human complexity. And so what I tried to do in my book was to actually have the girls talking a lot. And no girl who speaks in my book is an actual girl. They're all amalgams of other girls because that's the ethical and right thing to do. Um, but what people will find in my book is so often they're not actually at odds with themselves. They're at odds with real problems in the outside world that I am trying to help them get their hands around. And um, it was such, it's such a good thing, I think, um, in terms of how we talk about girls. They have to be spoken about in three dimensions. They cannot be spoken about in these flat caricatures that predominate around girls. And um, my husband's a teacher, and, and he said something on a back-to-school night that I think all of us can resonate to, which is he says, you know, you have this kid in class, and for the first few weeks, you're like, buddy, you got to get it together. Like, you got to get it together. And then it's parents' night, and you meet his folks, and you see him the next day, and you're like, dude, you're doing all right. <laughs> you're doing much, much better. And, and I think, you know, that that, that moment, you know, that for me is, that for me is what it means to try to speak about adolescent girls. It's so easy to be like, what is your deal? Like, you need to pull yourself together. And then, the more I know about teenage girls, I think these girls are functioning way better than they have a right to and far above the level where one would expect. And I get so bristly around people who speak ill of them because I'm thinking, you have no idea what they are contending with. So far above the level that you would expect given? Given the circumstances they are managing on a daily basis. Can you give an example? High school um, is stressful, High man. school is stressful. So it is also stressful if your dad is having a rip-roaring affair and your mom's coming home drunk every day. I mean, when I was thinking about your Upper East Side story, you know, one of the girls, I, I'm in the suburbs of Cleveland in Shaker Heights. I, you know, I treat a fairly wealthy clientele in my practice. And, you know, one of the girls I cared for for a long time, um, you know, her dad was off in Scotland playing golf because he could. And her mother was going in 30-day rehabs and then coming out and going to the liquor store and going back to the 30-day rehab. And she was being cared for by a housekeeper, but basically was driving herself to school. And I said to her, I said, how are you not driving your car through the living room at this point? Right? And this kid was functioning like a champ. And I, that piece gets lost too often. And also, yes. I, I think that you will probably <laughs> agree with this, there are also just the, the kids who the have day -to -day. a focus issue. Yeah. And the fact that they have a focus issue, like my 15-year-old daughter, produces anxiety. And so that's a, that's a runaway train. This sort of right? recursive So experience. by the end of the day, she goes to sleep when yes. she gets home. Eats a lot of food, goes to sleep. And I'm like, God, why can't she keep it together? Right. And then I read this book, and I think, <laughs> oh, duh. And She's then doing I read, great. She's doing great. <laughs> and then we read Nancy Joe's book, and we think to ourselves, even if we don't have that kind of severe example of dysfunctionality at home, social media and the constant objectification of girls mm. is its own epidemic. <laughs> um, well, I guess the question was how, <laughs> how do we talk about girls? Um, where do I begin, right? I mean, that's sort of what my book is about. Uh, how we talk about girls, how they're talked to, um, how they're defined, unfortunately, uh, outside of themselves. Uh, when I was doing this book, people would say to me, this is, a, this is what I got so often. Why are they so mean? Why do they dress like that? And why are they all drunk and slutty? You know, this kind of thing, right? I mean, there's been some cultural shifts in the way that girls dress and act and behave, it's true. Um, and I think some of us have noticed that, probably you have as teachers as well. There have been a lot of dress code protests all over the country. I don't know if you've been dealing with it. It's a very interesting issue, which I go into in my book. It's a very, like, passionate thing for girls. Um, but, I mean, the more I started to talk to them and listen to them and hear them, and also my book is largely in their voices as well. And it's funny because different, you know, uh, different disciplines, the ethical and right thing for me is to have them say exactly <laughs> what they actually said and be who they actually are. So, 
um, it's just different journalism versus you know it's a different thing so um, they were very often um, struggling all, almost all of them I mean I really actually can't think of one girl who was free from uh, grappling with stereotypes on a daily basis and grappling with with what I can only call sexism and sexual harassment something I wasn't really aware of because when I started at how prevalent it was in the lives of girls even in schools because um, what I you know at that point my daughter was only 12 she didn't have a phone yet so I wasn't yet dealing with all that stuff you know um, in terms of the the thing that was to come on social media, uh, where I saw all of these sort of societal trends that we're aware of, like sexism, sexual harassment, are sort of amplified and accelerated on social media. And that became something that I was, you know, really disturbed by as they were, and they talked about it constantly. It's not like they're not aware of it, because uh, social media is so very image-based and as we all know, I mean, women are already, you know, pressured into conforming to certain imagery, you know. Um, on social media, there's a quantifiable uh, success rate for, social, for, for posting, and it's called likes. I really think that someday, when they do a history of social media, uh, someone will do this, they will see when Facebook instituted the like as being a really significant moment in, in human behavior because it's already changing us kids and adults so much. And also the swipe from Tinder. I think that those two things it might sound trivial, but it's not. I mean, think how often you like something every day. And if you're on dating apps, how often you swipe every day. Or, you know, there's no shame in it or anything anymore. It's just what we do, right? So for girls, um, you know, the popularity contest that has always been high school now has a number. And I would go into schools where they actually knew the actual number of everybody they knew down to like maybe the number of that day. Like, oh, her, she has 632 followers on Instagram. You know, so um, it, it's not something to mock or laugh at though, because for them this pressure is extremely real. You know, I called this uh, book American Girls, which I think maybe my publisher <laughs> sometimes has wished that I hadn't because um, we're finding it's harder to sell abroad. Note that if you ever write a book, if you have ever an American in the title. But it was like, I wanted it to be girls rather than all teenagers, which maybe you can sell better too, I don't know. But I wanted it to be about girls to say their experiences are important. They're so often dismissed. They're so often silenced. I saw it even in my own reporting among their own parents and sometimes sadly teachers. I'm sure no one in this room, but sometimes teachers, you know, you're overtaxed, you get, you get overburdened with stuff and uh, it's too much to handle. It's too much. Right now we're living in the age of too much. Girls are dealing with too much. It's just too much exposure. It's too much self-publication. It's too much judging. It's too much sexuality at too young of an age and it's just too much and it, it is leading to all kinds of dysfunction so I, I, by saying American I'm you know it's it's like American as a kind of almost indictment um, I love America I'm a patriot okay but you know we gotta we gotta see that a lot of this dysfunction that's that exists in the lives of girls in terms of uh, the, all the sexism, materialism, body image, obsession, obsession with fame and the likes comes from, you know, deep within our, our American culture. So um, how do people talk about girls? How do, how do girls and boys talk now about each other constantly on social media? Uh, again, sometimes very judgmental, very sexualized. Uh, comments that, you know, if you were walking down the street and someone said them to you would be considered catcalling, but somehow it's what you cultivate and what you must get on social media. Hot, uh, you know, slut, which is sometimes good, you know, um, 
all these kinds of things. You know, I, I don't want to repeat the, all the, the language, and if you read my book, I apologize if this kind of thing offends you, but I felt like it was really important to see just how they are talking about each other. Not just girls and girls, boys and boys. There's a, it's called American Girls, but there's a lot about boys in the book because I was really, I, I mean, I've seen a lot. <laughs> I've been a, you know, I've been a reporter and gone to some crazy places, but I was shocked by 13-year-old boys in this country right now in a Dunkin' Donuts in Montclair, New Jersey. The kind of like sexual harassy craziness and, and homophobia too going on in a casual conversation over per the purchasing of donuts. You know, where uh, all kinds of words got thrown around and things got said that I, you know, I don't want to be like the old lady who says, well, back in my day, it was all perfect. I know it wasn't, <laughs> but I do think, and I try to chart in my book, certain trends and, 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 and like, you know, feminist movements and backlashes against movements and the rise of bro culture, and et cetera, and Maxim Magazine and the Wolf of Wall Street, yada, 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 that are telling our young men, boys, teenagers, that, you know, it's okay to treat women this way. It's okay to treat girls this way. And a lot of times girls, and to say these things to them, how we talk about girls is not just us, it's boys. And sometimes little boys. And I was very, you know, troubled by this and tried to portray it, you know, sometimes very graphically in the book, just to show. And I don't blame these boys either. They're children. I mean, this is, again, American girls, American boys. They're growing up in this culture where things are being taught to them. Um, maybe not by you and me or even their parents sometimes, but by media, by social media. And it's such a huge systemic problem, this problem of sexism and sexual harassment among kids today on social media, that it seems very daunting. Like I, I've given some talks all over the country now with parents and schools and stuff and, and, and it, like you talk for 45 minutes or something and then you look around the room and you're like, uh-oh, like I don't know if they're going to be able to get up, you know, because they're just like really upset. Like, Yeah, they're trying to pick themselves up off the floor. <laughs> yeah, like what do I do? And they know it sometimes and I'm sure since you're all teachers in the public schools in New York City, public, private, you know it too, right? I mean, you've seen this stuff. Like give, raise a hand if you've had a social media issue in your school. See, I know, it's everywhere. And there was just a study that said that um, uh, teachers say that cyberbullying, I mean like we think Obama did this great video about like it gets better. So, oh, so cyberbullying's been dealt with. He started this wonderful, you know, kind of uh, uh, government initiative with Michelle. It's not. It's worse than ever and, and teachers are saying that uh, it's one of the biggest problems in schools today because a lot of schools don't, there's all these problems are new. Phones came out in 2007, 2008 the Android, iPhones 2007, Android 2008. 2009, 2010, social media starts to go online. Not till 2011, 12, kids are really on it, on it all the time. And they are on it all the time. Like some studies say, every waking moment kind of thing. <laughs> Crazy. And we do, I, I just want to make sure we're keeping this moving along. Um, thank you, Nancy Joe. I know no, it's, it's really, we could talk about this all day. I just want to be really cognizant of the time. I also want to just point out, we, we, we do have some research that's now emerging around the relationship between the amount of time that a teenager is spending online and anxiety and depression. Mm -hmm. Lisa, I, didn't, I don't know if you have any of that at your fingertips. I know we ha we're seeing a correlation. So we're seeing a lot, right? I mean, and, and it's correlated with anxiety and depression. The other thing we see is the amount of time they're spending looking at images and cultivating images is correlated with body <coughs> image problems in boys and girls. Which is interesting. And, and one of the best pieces of advice that I've come across in talking with other experts is you know, how important it is for us to constantly be saying to teenagers, what you see online is as curated as what is in the magazine. You know, like we do all of this sort of media literacy around formal media, and we need to transfer that exact same media literacy around what their friend just so put I'm up. I'm going to do the snapping thing right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because those are as filtered and as crafted and as chosen. And yeah. it's helpful for girls when they get that. And we have research showing that it helps them to have that information. It actually does improve things. One thing to that point, um, if you have not seen Dove's self-esteem project video, run, don't walk home, and show it to every student you have. It's a one minute video that shows, that captures the process of how a, a model sits down and everything that gets done to her in order, which includes m modifying her. Can I, um, can I yeah. weigh in on that? Yeah. Girls today are, going through a little like 
well, I'd say big wave of feminism. You've all heard that in your schools, right? It's good, right? So I would talk to girls. Here's a conundrum for you. I would talk to girls where they know about those videos. They talk about feminism. They Her know friend. about the body issue stuff. No, no, no. I'm just I'm I'm reaffirming that it's important because it's some it's you'd think that that's something that they can use to affect their behavior and what they do and how they think. But it was sometimes I would have this these conversations with girls, you know, we'd sit down have really interesting conversations. Sometimes they're 13, they're smart. They can talk about stuff in this really analytical way. And they know about body image stuff and they know about, you know, pressure and all this stuff. And then I go on my social media where I follow all of them and one of them pops up in a bustier. And like, you know, I'm not trying to mock her or slut shame her. I'm just saying like, that's how hard it is for them to get away from this sexualization, a word that, you know, uh, they sometimes also know, or even hypersexualization. I don't. I. I try. I've tried in these talks I've been giving in schools and stuff to tell them like about the anxiety it can cause and about the depression and you know because sometimes they want to like you know they, they want to think that they can escape that. But so this is just. A, I didn't want to. Yeah, go ahead. But it's interesting because one of the things we see when we look at the data is there's changing knowledge base and there's changing behavior, right? And those are for humans two completely different functions. Um, every smoker knows they're not supposed to smoke, right? Every person with type 2 diabetes knows how they got there and is having a hard time reversing it, right? Like, so in some ways what we're seeing with adolescent girls, the knowledge base may be in place that it doesn't change behavior. It makes them like every other, you know, human that we see who's up against something that's destructive. Which gets me thinking, like, what can we do? So then what are the interventions and that are effective? what do we need to they do? They all need to read Tanya's book. And I know, and I, and I mean that. I mean that because I actually am of the mind increasingly that talking more about how they look may not be the solution to getting them to stop thinking about how they look, and and that in fact I wonder if we go completely in a different direction, which is let's talk about sources of purpose, let's talk about empathy, let's talk about people in other parts of the universe, not that it is a direct attack on the superficial, but I feel like well. If they are drawn to the superficial, as we all can be, the more time we can pull them to the substantive, the more time we can get them outside of their own lives. Substantive meaning like get them off their phone. Sometimes yes. I have these sometimes and I have these conversations and the parents will say, Well, what do I do? <laughs> and I mean you can I'm a reporter, like I'm not a parenting expert. It's not my job to tell you what to do with your kid. But that seems like the obvious solution, right? Take away their phone. It's like a kind it's now being established in neuro even neurobiologically neurobio as addiction, right? Your kid is addicted to the phone. And it's hurting them. But I can't, I can say that in front of you and you because we're trying to, you know, figure stuff out and help. But I can't, like, as an author, say that to parents because it's really not my role. It seems so obvious to me, though, you know, but they're, like, scared of their own kids or something. Like, she'll be mad at me if I take away the phone. She's going to be mad at me. And, like, well, so what? You know, do you want her on, on, on Instagram in a bustier? I mean, come on, like this is really kind of crazy. Yeah. And uh, oh, but it's body positive. That's her, you know, that's her choice. She's 14 and she doesn't know all of the ramifications for what this sort of online exposure can do. And uh, particularly in terms of sexing, but I guess that's another issue. I, I do think that you're I'm right. I mean, I know you're not calling out just this book in particular, but to broaden the horizon, to give someone more more breadth of their knowledge of what the world is, of what you have and don't have. Um, you know, just anecdotally, the teenagers who are in my world, they know a lot about girls in other countries now because they live with me, right? And, and my house is one of those houses where I have a 15-year-old and a 19-year-old, and my house is the house where everybody is, everybody comes. So, you know, every weekend there's probably 20 kids at my house, all, in and out and all the time. And I work in the main space of the house. I've got my stuff up. They see what I'm doing. They ask me questions. And their awareness of the world has changed through the course of me writing this book. It's a small number of kids, but they're aware. And it gets them talking about things like, wow, education is free in our country. I never thought about that. So, I mean, it's true that any kind of exposure that you can give to a kid that gets them out of their little bubble of looking at their screen or just being in their own little microcosm is going to be healthy, is going to maybe push their comfort zone, is going to broaden those horizons and get them to start thinking about what they, act. I mean, it sounds sort of like a platitude, you know, we should be thankful for this or we, and that a teenager wouldn't necessarily latch on to that. 
but they do. They, they have they to read. It. They have to read. Their brains aren't going to develop in the same way, and they're not going to be as 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 able to think, to actually think and write, and if they don't read, and I mean read a lot, I don't think kids in this country read enough. I know your teachers are making them read more, and thank you. But they, they're on their phones more. I mean, there's, you know, again, study, study, studies. There's all kinds of studies that say they're on their phones more, they're reading less. They have to read. How are they gonna read if they're on this phone all the time? How are they gonna read if they're spending three hours in the afternoon putting up, contouring their makeup and doing their whatever to take, a, take 70 selfies and then filtering the selfies and editing the selfies so they look perfect and being complicit and buying into all that pressure. And they where are the parents? Read. Where are the parents? I mean, I mean, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm imagining that a lot of teachers are also parents, but they're also asking, where are the parents? They're giving um, them the phones. Yeah. They're saying, oh, honey, look, now you have a thousand followers on Instagram. Yeah. Yeah, so and just a last question, and then we'll close the panel, is this whole notion of the spectrum of hope and worry. Oh. <laughs> when I read these three books, I, you know, I, as, as a head of a girls' school, as a mother of a girl and a boy, um, and as a young woman, I still can call myself young, uh, I am comforted by Lisa Demore's book. Um, it, what she writes, when you understand the important developmental work your daughter is doing, you'll fret less about some of her puzzling behaviors. Lisa's focus is to explain why these puzzling behaviors are happening and normalizes them, many of them, as developmentally healthy. And she has a very small section in every chapter uh, entitled, When to Worry. <coughs> now, and then when I read Nancy Joe's book, it's kind of, I feel my, my insides clenching up. I'm very anxious. Because it's almost as if um, when to worry all the time is, is Nancy Joe's response to Lisa's um, suggestion. And then I read, Nancy, uh, I read Tanya Lee Stone's book, which seems to be in the middle somewhere, right? She's staring into the dark underbelly of some of the most atrocious things being done to young girls and women. Child, sl child, child marriage, um, slavery, no school. And yet she, she somehow seems to recover a kind of positive uh, girlhood, uh, a very hopeful um, outlook. On I girlhood, I don't think my book says worry all the time. <laughs> no, it's that was my no. that was my that was my response no, to it. I yeah, I mean it's a book of reporting. I'm giving you some information. You do with it what you will. But I think worry is a negative emotion that does nothing. Let's do something about it. But you know, like I said, I'm just giving people the information and hoping they'll figure it out. My pub, you know, that's what I'm used to is just telling people stuff and you figure it out. Um, but my publisher made me do a conclusion, and uh, I mean. Girls need feminism. They need to know what this all means from the earliest age, from kindergarten, you know. And they need not to be on their phone so much and they need to read. I don't think it's like rocket science to figure this out. I don't think we need to worry. I just think we need to do something about it. And it seems pretty obvious to me, actually, but I, I'm not everybody's parent. But I think the thing that you did such an amazing job with in your book that is not obvious is dealing with the issue of pornography and its impact on adolescent sexuality as we stand right now. And I will say that most of my book... gives me a book, lot of worry. Which, and I will tell you, most of my book is, don't worry about this, don't worry about this, don't worry about this. And then on that one, I'm like, this is on fire. Okay. This is on fire. Yeah. And, and I've had a lot of parents say to me, your book made me feel so much better, except for the part that scared me, which is the part about pornography. And I think yeah. it's one of those conversations that adults just don't want to have. And it's just one of those things that we'd really rather not deal with. And I would put myself squarely in that camp. Um, and yet, I know, and I know any of us who are really up against adolescence right now know this is changing what they think romance is, what they think sex is, what they think dating is, what they think courting is, what they think you should look like, how they think you should function. And um, I think we've come to the end of ignoring it um, as a factor. And I think one of the things you get at, and I think it's so critical, I think a lot of us who see ourselves as very liberal feel like we're supposed to be okay with porn. And I think what we need to say is, oh, no, no, no. Go look at what they're looking at. It doesn't matter what your politics are. Like it's you the most violent, it's unbelievably awful. Yeah, kind of stuff. it's not erotica. I mean, it's really not. And so you I all think know what it is. If I, if someone had asked me three, four years ago, what do you think of porn? I would said, I don't. You know, yeah. whatever you're into. I am yeah. not a consumer of porn, but it's not the same. Yeah. And there's, you know, there's, uh, 
It's not the same. It's very, like, the way that, like, there's now more explosions and kills in movies, there's now more of, like, everything extreme and porn. It's called extreme porn. But and that's, that's how they get clicks, and that's how they get likes, and that's how they get views, and that's how they raise the, uh, their company. The Communications Decency Act, I'll tell you really quickly, 1996, it was when a bunch of congressmen said, oh, my God, kids are watching porn. We better do something about it. Porn companies, internet companies, you're wondering, like, why can they see porn when they can't see it in the store? We've already decided kids shouldn't see porn. Porn companies, internet companies, the ACLU, which understandably thought, oh, well, this will put, you know, this will, if we have blocks and filters, this will, you know, like, be an obstacle to free speech, you know, jumped on this whole thing. And then this bill that was supposed to be about blocking kids from seeing porn became about giving immunity to social media companies for being the third party purveyors of anything like porn pornographic on the internet. So, in other words, like sex tapes of, you know, kids that get passed around, non-consensual nudes, which is a huge issue. Have anybody had that issue in your school? The non-consensual sharing of nudes, which is a terrible, terrible, oppressive thing for girls right now, happening everywhere, all over the country. Uh, you know, one thing I tell girls, you know, again, I'm not, a, you know, like a, a therapist or something or whatever, but I tell them, like, don't ever think that that nude will just be seen by that boy. Mm -hmm. It will be seen by all of the boys, because that's what they do with it, because it's currency, and that's how they get props, is for showing the nudes around, and they try and collect them and stuff. So, like... I don't know about you, but I'm worried. They're like, they're <laughs> like, but who does that? Who collects c pictures of nude women and publishes them on a, on a something, like an Instagram? A pornographer. So we have little boys acting like pornographers. So you how know? do we find hope in all of this? Let's end with some well, hope. I mean, yeah, Tanya, find, find, find us some hope here. <laughs> Let's go outside of America for a moment, <laughs> and, and I'll share some hope with you. Um, this week, actually, this past week, um, our, our first girl, Rising Girl, who five years ago was living and working in a dump in Cambodia, um, just got accepted to Kendall College in Chicago. And she's going to be here for the next few years. So that's pretty hopeful. That's pretty amazing. Um, and, and like you said, I have been in the underbelly of these major issues like child marriage, like uh, forced labor, uh, human trafficking. But on the other side of that is this um, awareness that with the gift of education, everything changes. Everything changes. So Girl Rising is a, a kind of beautiful balance of let's look at this really dark, difficult stuff and not turn away from it. And also, let's rise up and, and celebrate these, these people, these girls, these people, who now have the gift of education and are going to have different lives, and so are their families. I celebrate all American girls, because I, especially now, because I think that what they're dealing with now, which seems so much worse than even when I was a girl, is so tough. And yet, they're smart, they're resilient, they manage to make it to the SAT class and do great and get good grades and get into college and deal with stuff. And I'm just so amazed by all of them that I spoke to because, I mean, it's just like this constant, you know, like the split screen thing is very hard to deal with, the pressure. But I, I, I'm, I'm heartened and hopeful just by them and, and their potential, you know. Here, here. Here, here. Okay, so just to wrap it up, I'm going to repeat a few phrases. I always find it's helpful to wrap up with a few phrases. How girls are defined outside of themselves. Becoming humble in the face of complexity. Not making the assumptions that we understand girls. You know nothing. <laughs> We've always had sexism, stereotype, sexual assault, and sexual harassment. They're amplified by social media. Girls are dealing with too much. Popularity contest that has always been now has a number. And education is the hope. Thank you so, so much. This is a great conversation.